YouTube page and linked to the web page. Uh, the goal of this is uh, that it will be able to serve as a reference for those who have joined us today, but those also who were unable to join us. Um, and then we also, you'll have noted that we have placed everyone on mute. Um, we've muted your microphones for now. So uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, you can share your name, your role, your institution, your email address, anything you wish to share with others on the call today. Um, and you're welcome throughout the presentation to ask questions in the chat. Um, once we get to the live Q&A portion of this uh, presentation, of this session together today, we'll allow you to come off of mute, ask your questions live, so this can be a bit of a dialogue. Um, but for the presentation period, we're going to keep folks muted, and then you can just type your questions in the chat. Um, my colleague, Lori Sara, will be monitoring the chat. If it's a quick and easy question to answer, she'll answer it directly in the chat. If not, she'll copy it over to a form that we'll then go through during the Q&A session um, to address some more in-depth questions that, that you all may have posed. Um, additionally, we're going to ask while the presentation portion is ongoing, um, that you disable your video so that we can improve the session for those that have bandwidth limitations. Uh, again, once we come to the, um, the Q&A portion, if, especially if you're asking a question, we'd love to see your face while you're asking it, so please feel free to, to enable your video at that time. Um, and then one final note before we jump into the session agenda is that um, if you are a Francophone innovator, um, we just wanted to flag that we will be hosting this session um, in French on Monday at the same time. So if you would prefer to attend the French session, um, you feel free to drop off now um, and register for, for the French session on Monday. You can find that registration link on the French version of our webpage. Um, and if you're having trouble finding that, please just reach out to the stars at grandchallenges.ca uh, team and we'll make sure you get that registration link. All right, moving along to the session agenda. So today we're going to start with an overview of the stars and global health program. We're then going to cover the RFP focus areas. After that, we'll dive into some key funding details and deadlines. We'll cover project eligibility. We'll then run through an overview of the screening and review process. We'll offer a few application tips. And then really, um, the last half of this session is when we'll, we'll turn it over to you to ask any pressing questions you may have um, in order to feel comfortable and confident moving forward with your applications to this STARS Round 12 funding call. So the STARS and Global Health Program supports bold ideas with big impact from the best and brightest scientists and innovators, both in low and middle income countries and in Canada to address some of the most pressing global health challenges. It provides funding to explore transformative ideas at proof of concept that apply integrated innovation in order to sustainably bring solutions to scale. STARS and Global Health is Grand Challenges Canada's flagship portfolio to test the potential of new pipeline in areas of strategic interest for Grand Challenges Canada and our funders. It's designed as a flexible portfolio to ad allow adaptability at each round of funding to meet the most salient development needs. The STARS program also provides responsiveness to changing global priorities with an ability to fill funding gaps and take a critical role in the ecosystem such as providing innovation funding to address the human health impacts of climate change in low and middle income countries. I think it's fair to assume that all of us on today's call are well aware that climate change is already impacting human health in a number of ways. This includes through direct risk pathways, such as increasing temperatures, drought, flooding, and other extreme weather events, as well as through indirect ecosystem and societal pathways, such as air pollution, food and nutrition security, infectious disease threats, migration, conflict, and damage to health infrastructure and services. The adverse effects of climate change on human health range from injuries, mental health impacts, cardiovascular and respiratory disease, undernutrition, and communicable diseases, including vector water and foodborne diseases, just to name a few. 
Additionally, a growing body of evidence strongly suggests that climate change amplifies existing gender inequities, leading to unique health threats for women and girls. It's widely believed that these consequences could ultimately reverse progress made towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The World Health Organization has recognized climate change as the single biggest threat facing humanity. And the COVID-19 pandemic has only served to highlight the deep inequities and in health sector vulnerabilities across the globe. However, despite the fact that 54% of nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement feature adaptation and identify health as a priority sector, climate change adaptation in health represents less than 1% of international climate finance. Implementation of health adaptation has been incremental largely because of these significant financial constraints. In fact, the latest IPCC report indicates that the overwhelming majority of global tracked climate finance was targeted to mitigation, which refers to efforts to reduce or, or prevent greenhouse gas emissions, and has largely been focused on high-income countries. While these investments are absolutely needed, Populations in less industrialized countries who have contributed the least to the climate crisis are now the most widely impacted by climate change and its negative health impacts. These same low income and resource exploited countries and communities are least able to protect themselves and receive relatively minuscule investments towards much needed adaptation and resilience efforts. There is therefore a clear need for funding directed specifically towards the implementation of adaptation efforts in low and middle income countries. There is also a role for innovation as implementers explore the cross sectoral collaborations needed to effectively address the health impacts of climate change. With all of this in mind, through this request for proposals, GCC seeks, to bo seeks bold ideas that address the human health impacts of climate change in low and middle income countries. These innovative solutions are expected to address the adaptation gaps and build resilience against the effects of climate change on the human health and well being of underserved communities. Solutions should consider the fact that older adults, women, young people, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, LGBTQI plus individuals and other traditionally underserved and minority groups are vulnerable to the health impacts of climate change in many contexts. Proposed innovations must be bold, innovative, and designed with and for people who are not adequately served by current approaches. Innovations should seek to enable communities in either or both urban and rural environments to prepare for and protect health and well-being as the climate emergency makes the way we've lived unsustainable. Applicants will be required to describe how the health challenge being addressed is specifically being worsened by climate change, current and anticipated, in the proposed implementation context. They will also be need to explain how the proposed solution will address the selected human health impact as exacerbated by climate change. Some examples of areas that we are interested in funding are innovations that increase nutrition or water security, such as interventions that ensure the affordability of healthy diets or protect nutritious food supplies. This could also include community level water management interventions that improve stable access to safe water. Innovations that address mental and psychological health challenge resulting from or amplified by climate related displacement or migration are also of interest. As are in innovations that reduce the impact of poor air quality on health, reduce the impact of heat stress on health, and innovations that address vector water and foodborne disease threats, specifically threats that are moving into new populations and or geographic uh, and, and or geographies due to climactic variability and change. We're also in a, interested in innovations that develop or adapt monitoring and modeling and forecasting solutions. Where possible, all innovations should seek to build the resilience and response capacity of the communities and systems they're intervening with. Healthcare, food, and nutrition, water, and sanitation uh, systems, as an example. Given the role and limitations of proof of concept funding, as well as our desire to specifically address funding gaps, there are some topics and areas that are going to be excluded from consideration under this RFP. This includes mitigation efforts, 
such as interventions to reduce emissions or address carbon capture and sequestration. This includes energy solutions such as biofuels, batteries, solar powers, nuclear plants, and new materials. Interventions that address deforestation such as clean cook stove and clean cooking fuels will not be considered either. Innovations that address transportation infrastructure or socioeconomic systems are also excluded, um, as are innovations that broadly address food systems and crop yields. Um, our friends at GC Africa, um, housed under the Science for Africa Foundation, are actually running um, currently an RFP uh, to focus on African agriculture, climate adaptation, um, research systems. So if, you're, if your area of interest and focus is in agricultural systems, we strongly encourage you to look into that RFP um, as your proposal will likely be a better fit uh, to the Science for Africa RFP. Um, finally, monitoring, modeling, and forecasting solutions that do not offer a clear and feasible mechanism for acting upon either the data or predictions generated from uh, advanced monitoring and modeling systems will not be considered. In other words, if you are presenting a monitoring, modeling, or forecasting solution, you must ensure that including it in your proposal um, will be a component of the project that seeks to clearly link the data or predictions to action within the targeted communities. Again, we'll have we'll have room for questions about all of this um, during the Q&A period. Now some exciting specifics. Uh, this program will fund seed grants or proof of concept pilots up to 150,000 Canadian dollars. Uh, with project periods of up to 18 months. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, apply for a shorter period and a smaller amount of funding if that's the right fit for your proposal. Um, please note that one of the evaluation criteria is value for money. Um, so you'll need to be very clear about why the funding and the timeline are uh, appropriate for your project in your application. We expect to fund approximately 30 awards through this call, um, of which successful South Africa-based grants will be co-funded by our friends at the South Africa Medical Research Council. So if you are a South Africa-based in, uh, institution, please uh, ensure that you're reviewing the section of the RFP that clarifies the funding requirements of the South African Medical Research Council, as you will likely end up with two subgrants, one from GCC and one from um, SAMRC. In terms of geographic scope, entities formed and legally incorporated in Canada or in a low and middle income country are eligible to apply. Projects must be implemented in a lower middle income country. Um, and it's also worth noting that a minimum of 60% of awards will be allocated to projects implementing specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, when we refer to eligible countries in low and middle income, uh, countries, uh, please review Appendix A of the RFP, which has a full, complete list of eligible countries. Uh, as for target users, solutions funded through this call must address the needs of unserved or underserved communities and low and middle income countries. Where possible, proposals should seek to address the increased vulnerability of women and girls to the health impacts of climate change. And more broadly, solutions should consider the fact that older adults, women, young people, Indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, LGBTQI plus individuals, and other traditionally underserved and minority groups are most vulnerable to the health impacts of climate change in many contexts. Deadlines. There are two very important deadlines to consider as part of this RFP application process. The first is the registration deadline. If you are an innovator who has never received a GCC funding award or who has never applied to GCC for funding, it likely means that you do not yet have an account for our grant management system called Flux. You need to register for an account 
on the Flux system in order to be able to access the online application template. So the registration deadline is December 15, 2022 at 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, please note that there will be a, a couple days turnaround time uh, to process registrations. So um, there's no need to register twice. It will take a day or two. And if there's you know, a large volume of registrations in one period, it could be up to three days. Uh, our team works to process these registrations as quickly as possible, but do allow a few days, especially if you've applied over a weekend or if there's a Canadian holiday. Um, so please just keep that in mind. Then the application deadline, which is the final deadline under this RFP to submit your actual proposal is December 22nd, 2022, again at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, please ensure that you're trying to submit ahead of that date and time deadline, uh, because if you encounter um, if you encounter technical issues that are preventing the submission, if you've not reached out to us ahead of that submission deadline to communicate challenges, there won't be much we can do. Uh, so do your best to ensure that you're giving yourself enough time to uh, build in, uh, yeah, wiggle room <laughs> in case of potential technical um, issues or you know power outages or the like. Um, moving on to eligibility criteria. So once the application deadline has passed and application intake is complete, all proposals go through a multi-step review process. And this begins with the eligibility screen. Grand Challenges Canada will screen applications on the basis of the eligibility criteria outlined in the RFP. Applications that do not meet the eligibility criteria will be removed from the review process. It is essential that every applicant review in detail, probably helpful to review with others to ensure you're, you're clear, the eligibility criteria section of the RFP. If you do not meet eligibility criteria, as I mentioned, the application will be removed from the review process. Um, we're gonna cover here a few key eligibility criteria, but this is not the um, exhaustive list. So again, please review the eligibility criteria section in the RFP to ensure clarity um, and that you have a comprehensive uh, understanding. So uh, entities eligible under this funding call include social enterprises and other legally recognized organizations such as non-governmental organizations, non-profits, for-profits, and limited liability, limited liability companies, as well as research and academic institutions, and really any other appropriately registered legal entity. And when we talk about appropriately registered and legal entities, what we're really looking for here is that the entity is formed and legally incorporated in an eligible country, again, the eligible country list is in Appendix A of the RFP, that the entity is in active in term is active in terms of their status and in good standing with their respective registration body, um, is capable of entering into a funding agreement with Grand Challenges Canada, can receive foreign funding and administer grant funding, and can successfully perform activities in their technical areas. The following entity types are ineligible under this RFP. This includes individuals, sole proprietorships, unincorporated trusts and partnerships, government organizations, and United Nations country offices. Another area of eligibility criteria is that um, it pertains to the applications themselves. So applications must include all required information and address all questions. Applications must be submitted in either English or French. Please note that the quality of the English or French language proposal will not play a factor in the evaluation of the proposal unless it affects the clarity of the information. We're not going to be too con con concerned about uh, grammar or anything like that. We, as long as the reviewers can understand 
the um, what's being proposed. That is really the focus, not on uh, language skills, as we absolutely recognize that the majority of our applicants first languages are not English and French, and so that should not penalize you. Um, please also note that uh, a majority of the applications activities and budget must be carried out or spent in an eligible implementation country. And applications must be submitted by the eligible applicant entity. Along with that, the project lead listed on the application must be affiliated with the applicant organization. The project lead should be the person with the highest level of responsibility working directly on the project. A project lead can only be listed on one application, but please note that single institutions can submit multiple applications, but each of those applications needs a different project lead. Also, applicants must be able to obtain any legal and or regulatory approvals, uh, consents or reviews required to accept foreign grant funds and or to conduct project activities before finalizing a funding agreement. Uh, specifically for Indian innovators, this uh, often relates to FCRA approvals about receiving foreign funds. Grand Challenges Canada will require applicants to demonstrate, uh, will require Canadian applicants to demonstrate collaboration with innovators from the country of implementation. Um, we know that these eligibility criteria, there are many eligibility criteria and they can often be somewhat confusing. Uh, we're of course happy to answer questions um, during the Q&A period and, and in the chat, as I'm sure my colleague Lori is actively doing. We also encourage you if you have um, outstanding questions or you're just not 100% sure that you're clear about various eligibility criteria, we've done our best over the years um, to outline additional clarity and guidance for these eligibility criteria items in the um, FAQ document. So if you've not taken a look at the FAQ document, we strongly suggest you review that um, as it just has expanded guidance on, on some of these criteria that uh, innovators in the past have explained are a little bit uh, tricky to, to wrap their heads around. So please do take a look at that resource. It's available on the STARS webpage. All right, moving on to the innovation screen. So applications that are deemed eligible will move forward to the innovation screen stage. During this stage, the project summary section will be assessed by Grand Challenges Canada staff and external volunteers. Please note that only a subset of questions, those identified in the application form uh, with an asterisk, will be reviewed at this stage to determine if applications will proceed to the next evaluation step. So ensure these questions are adequately addressed. Uh, relevance and innovation criteria categories carry equal weight in the review process. Um, and please keep these criteria in mind when completing your application. Um, often we find that innovators who are actively reviewing the evaluation criteria are able to map those evaluation criteria onto the application questions. We intentionally create them that way um, so that you're, you're quite confident that your answers to the application questions are sufficiently addressing the evaluation criteria. Applications that are deemed relevant and score highly at the application or at the innovation screen stage will then move forward to the external peer review stage. At this stage, an independent expert peer review panel of external scientific, technological, social, business, and sustainability experts will review the full applications using the criteria categories displayed here. At this review stage, each criteria category are weighted differently. Again, please keep these criteria in mind when completing your application and the full list of uh, evaluation criteria under each of these criteria categories can be found in full in the RFP document. Okay, now a few notes on what we will not fund through this RFP. 
Um, projects involving establishing proof of concept of innovations for which the core intellectual property rights are owned by a third party. We will not fund those unless the third party either grants the applicant sufficient license rights to the innovation to permit eventual scaling in low and middle income countries, or the third party institution signs an undertaking to comply with Grand Challenges Canada's sharing and access for impact strategy. That sharing and access for impact strategy can be found uh, on the Grand Challenges Canada resource page. And so if you're dealing with some IP rights uh, concerns, um, we suggest that you engage with that third party, share this uh, sharing and access for impact strategy, and get aligned before you submit the proposal and work your way through this whole process uh, just to be let down at the end. Another thing we won't fund is projects similar to ones Grand Challenges Canada has already funded. This sort of goes against uh, the bold um, criteria, whether uh, a, an application or a proposal is, is unique and novel. Uh, so please review our searchable database of funded innovations for more information on previously funded projects. Uh, on the next slide, we'll provide the link to that page. Additionally, we will not fund projects implementing in countries that are not listed in Appendix A of the RFP. So please, please review Appendix A of the RFP and ensure you are clear on whether your the institution through which you are applying is eligible and the implementation country that you're proposing is eligible. Finally, we will not fund projects that are focused strictly on capacity building or advocacy and that do not involve the testing of an innovative proof of concept. Projects can include components of capacity building and or advocacy, but they must also involve the testing of a proof of concept idea. Uh, as promised, the link um, here to our the, to Grand Challenges Canada Innovation Database. It's easily accessible on our website through the Learn What We Do uh, menu tab. And a few application tips. Um, if you are reviewing the application questions in the PDF that's provided on our web page, uh, that is absolutely no problem, but be mindful of the character limits. Um, there are strict character limits to ensure that applications are not too lengthy um, and you must abide by those. So be careful if you're working on this application offline when you carry and copy things over to the application template, there's a risk that things might get cut off and you will not be able to go over those character limits. So only be highly descriptive when it's necessary to convey the key message. Otherwise, concise answers are always best. Um, also, please respond in narrative format rather than in bullets. It usually ensures a more cohesive uh, narrative explanation. Address all parts of each question. Read the questions carefully. Some questions have multiple components and all sections of any question are required to successfully submit the application. Finally, be sure to take note of the questions with the asterisks. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these questions will be the only ones reviewed at the initial innovation screen stage. So be sure you've taken particular care in providing strong, complete responses to these. All right, next, uh, some guidance on uh, flux registration for those who have um, not registered before or uh, applied to a Grand Challenges Canada um, RFP before. To apply for funding, applicants must use the online application provided, which is only accessible through the Grand Challenges Canada Flux portal. And you must register for an account by December 15th, as previously mentioned. To create a Flux account, you can use the link provided in this slide, which is also in the RFP and, our, and on our STARS program webpage. If you already have a Flux account, then you can sign in and begin your draft application. If you have forgotten your password, there's an option to retrieve that password and sign in again. 
please note that the application must be submitted using the account of an eligible individual and an eligible organization or entity. Once an application is created, the details from the account used will be displayed as project lead and applicant entity on the application form. These cannot be changed without contacting Grand Challenges Canada. Only applications submitted by accounts that meet eligibility criteria will be considered and reviewed. If you are on this call, you have probably familiar sell familiarize yourselves already with the STARS web page, uh, but just a reminder that all the docu all the key launch documents, the request for proposals, the frequently asked questions, the two-pager overview, as well as the list of application questions, are all available in both English and French on GCC STARS and Global Health webpage. That concludes the presentation portion of this session. So if you've not already done so, please feel free to add your questions to the chat. Um, as mentioned, we will also be opening up the floor. Um, you can feel free to use the raise hand function in the reactions menu, um, and then we'll call on you and ask you to unmute yourself um, if you wanted to ask a question live. Uh, I will be going through to begin with the list of questions that my colleague Lori has copied over from the chat, um, and then we'll move on to, to some live questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing now so I can see the group. And feel free to turn your cameras on if you'd like not a requirement, um, but thank you for your patience as we went through this uh, presentation. And I am just going to work through the questions that my colleague has copied over here from the chat. Um, feel free to keep adding questions in the chat. If, you're, if your uh, question has been answered and you have a follow-up question, we're happy to address that. So first we have here from Martina. You've said that you will fund initiatives that impact nutrition, which ensure the affordability of healthy diets or protect nutritious food supplies, but also said you will not fund innovations that broadly address food systems and crop yields. Can you explain the difference between the two? What would count as allowable nutrition initiatives? So thank you for this question. Um, this is an area that we um, sort of struggled to uh, tread the line here with. And so our goal here is to avoid getting applications that broadly address um, large scale systems, because we want to bring these innovations to the community impact level. And so if, of course, communities themselves are systems, and so um, perhaps we could have worded that more specifically. Um, Martina, did you want to come off of mute and and help me um, work through what you're what you're trying to to address here. Oh, I'll ask to unmute. Oh, that worked great. Um, so yeah, so a lot of um, nutrition initiatives often include um, growing nutritious food at the community level. So growing leafy green vegetables, um, ver various uh, things. So I guess I'm I'm wondering how we can ensure that. So you've clarified. So you're not looking for a large scale food system impact, but a community level impact. So would community like growing promotion of growing nutritious vegetables count as yes. allowable for a nutrition initiative? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the sort of level that we were we were thinking, and that will be the guidance we provide to our reviewers as well. I would caution that you know local growing uh, of, of more diversified, more nutritious um, crops, not particularly new or novel Correct. broadly, we right? Need so you would need, way. Exactly. So you would need to make the case for what is innovative, 
about your particular innovation and intervention, especially within the context that you will be delivering it. So that kind of, that's also the tension with this type of innovation as well. So just make sure you're really making clear what is innovative about that type of solution. Perfect, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, great. Moving on to our next question from, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, Herminio. The proposal may come with a research component, for example, to assess the impact of the intervention. Yes, uh, so, and there's a follow up here. The intervention I am proposing to the target community has already been tested and used in many contexts, but not in the target community. How will this fact this affect my proposal eligibility? OK, I'll address these separately. So um, absolutely, we expect that any proposal um, because these are proof of concept grants will include a strong monitoring and evaluation component. And so because to be able to assess whether proof of concept was achieved, you will have needed to evaluate the impact of your value uh, of your implementation. And so absolutely, um, a good portion of funds can be allocated to this research monitoring and evaluation component. Um, Herminio, did you have any follow up on that that you wanted to address or does that adequately uh, cover that part of the question? Okay, please put a please put a follow up question in the in the chat if it's not adequately addressed. Then the second question that you asked Herminio is the intervention I'm proposing to the target community has already been tested and used in many contexts, but not in the target community. So this is similar to uh, part of the response that I offered to Martina. You'll need to make a clear case for why the intervention you are proposing in the specific implementation context is indeed bold and unique. Um, if in the specific community, the region, the country, this intervention has never been tested and this implementation context is you know, sufficiently distinct from you indicated it's been implemented in Brazil, if there's a sufficient distinction uh, for whatever reason uh, between the context in which it's already been tested and where it has not yet been tested and where you're proposing to implement, then you, I, you have a case to make there. Um, and we've absolutely funded that kind of replication testing before. Um, so just make sure that you are making a strong case for that in your, in your proposal. Okay, there's a question here. I tried several times on different devices to look at the GCC searchable database and was unable to search for different projects. Are there issues with the website? Is there another format we can access the information to ensure we're not doing similar projects? Um, we will have to look into this. If you're having specific issues with, with um, accessing the database, I've recently used it and not experienced any issues. Um, it is not the most user friendly, I will admit that. Um, but Martina, please feel free to follow up with an email to the stars at grandchallenges.ca team. And we're happy to work with our tech um, team to, to make sure that you're able to review the data that, that you want to see there. Um, so, so just uh, send us a follow up email and we'll make sure you get access to that. Okay, Dieter asked, if a UN country office is identified as a collaborator, how should that be reflected in the budget as a subgrantee or a subcontract? Great question. Uh, this comes down to this sometimes confusing distinction between subgrantee and subcontract. If it's not 100% accurately reflected in the application, it's not the end of the world, but I know that it makes a difference for the um, budget caps. So that's probably why there's a desire for clarity there. So generally, what we suggest is that a subcontractor is going to be providing a very discreet set of services. Their scope of work will be very well defined, and they're likely providing you with an invoice at the end. 
Um, whereas a subgrantee is much more of a either research or implementation um, partner through your project journey. Um, and so if they're really essential and they're offering a, a variety a, you know, of expertise and um, with a less defined scope uh, of, of work, um, then I would suggest that that is probably a subgrantee. Um, if you are concerned about uh, appropriately identifying, especially due to uh, budgetary caps, Again, that is a level of specificity that we would need a little bit more information. And so you can follow up with us um, via email to get a little bit more clarity on that. But I hope that that's at least provided some initial direction about how to think about that. Um, okay. Usa or Yusa has, has asked a question. Regarding mitigation efforts, such as interventions to reduce emissions or address carbon capture and sequestration that you will not, would this include natural-based car carbon capture? Yeah, we're just, we've excluded mitigation efforts um, entirely uh, based on some, a number of engagements that we've had with folks that have been working in this space for a lot longer than GCC has. Um, it was suggested that there, we needed to, to find some area of, of specificity. We needed to sort of set some boundaries for this funding call. And so unfortunately mitigation efforts in their entirety are not going to be um, considered for this call. Okay, beyond what is written in the innovation document, this is from Martina. Can you define what counts as scientific or technical innovation or social innovation with examples? Um, I can try. Um, <laughs> so when we're talking about scientific or, so I'm assuming Martina, this is coming from the section that addresses um, our GCC's approach to integrated innovation, which for those of you who may be less familiar, um, GCC takes an approach to innovation that considers sort of three main areas. And we believe that this is where um, teams can really get to um, impact and sustainability. When there is a lens to the scientific and technical aspect of an intervention, when there is a lens to the social implications, and when there is a lens to the business and sustainability aspects. And so we have absolutely realized over the years that um, not, especially at proof of concept, not every innovation can and should address um, or prioritize each of these areas of integration of integrated innovation, but many will be addressing um, them in some ways or some components. And so if you are, for instance, Martina, you raised a, a potential about projects on uh, focused on nutrition. And so the scientific or technological or technical innovation component would be like, what is the, why are you choosing to work with um, community members on growing X leafy green vegetable? What is the science that indicates that this leafy green vegetable is indeed um, highly nutritious and beneficial to the diets, health, and well being of the community that you're working with? The social aspect would be considerations of, for instance, is that leafy green vegetable acceptable to the community with whom you are working? Um, and then maybe the business and sustainability component would be how are these community members accessing the seeds um, needed to plant these new crops? Are they going to be available? Do they have, um, you know, the resources for necessary chemical inputs, for instance, if that is gonna be a component of the training. Um, Martina, does that help? I'll let you put a follow-up question if, if there's needed follow-up there. Okay. Um, Dom, there's other integrated um, 
sorry, I'm cutting you off. There's other inter no. innovation questions. Maybe you want to touch on those since you were on the topic. But uh, after Martina's one that you just um, answered, there was um, also from Martina uh, for integrated innovation. Do we have to integrate all or can it be just two? And then, yeah. Um, job also, well, I answered in the chat, but maybe useful for everyone. Can the project cut across two or three areas of the innovation or must it be specific? I suppose um, two is okay, but just for everyone, um, we don't expect projects to only touch uh, one uh, area of, of innovation. That's why we call it integrated innovation, but maybe Dom, you can expand if you. If you... Yeah, thanks, Lori. So, um... Yeah, so for Martina and Usa, uh, do we have to integrate all three areas of integrated innovation or is just two allowed? As Lori just said, um, we would generally expect that at least two are being considered in some form or another. Um, if there is no, if you're just taking sort of this singular perspective, um, there will be concern in the review process about you know the strength and sustainability of of the proposal so i would really encourage the team to think and present at least two areas of integration all three is not necessary um and then i'm seeing jobs question but i think there's a, a bit of a um we're taking a different question here because the question is can the project cut across two or three areas of intervention, or must it be specific? Um, so certainly the project can cut across multiple areas of intervention. I would strongly caution the team to be very realistic about what is achievable within an 18 month time period and, 100, and with 150,000 Canadian dollars. Um, if you make a compelling case in your proposal, that your team can achieve uh, impact on multiple areas of intervention, wonderful. But just be really realistic. Um, and you know, there what we've seen in the past is certainly our reviewers um, at the uh, peer review stage are uh, maybe particularly apprehensive about proposals that are essentially trying to do what they think is too much in too little time with too little money. So um, go with your gut, uh, make an informed decision about what you think is feasible. Uh, Job also asked a question in the chat about what is ex what expected target population quantitative. So I'm, ex I think you're asking, um, about the number, like the, the actual size and number of, of folks in your um, sample expected for proof of concept. That varies significantly depending on often the breadth or depth of an intervention. So if an intervention is being proposed, I'll go back to, you know, sort of some of our past rounds to take examples for this. So, um, in the last round of funding, um, it was focused on sexual reproductive health and rights, and there was a lot of um, app-based solutions being tested. So that is a limited depth, high breadth intervention, meaning that the degree of impact received from engaging with an app is going to be relatively limited. And so we expect that that intervention reaches into the thousands of people to be able to adequately assess impact. Whereas if we're talking about an intervention that is offering one-on-one -on -one counseling to survivors of sexual and gender-based violence in an ongoing manner, that is the depth of impact of that type of intervention is going to be much greater. And so we would expect that type of proposal to be targeting fewer uh, individuals to assess impact. And that could be, you know, in the low hundreds. Um, so it's really about how you expect to be able to assess impact. Is your 
sample group large enough to actually be able to speak to the impact of the proposed intervention. Job, I hope that um, addresses your question. Please add any follow-ups. Paul, I see you've had your hand raised for a while now, so we're finally going to turn to you. So I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes, oh. sorry, but maybe quickly, um, there's a question from Evans also. Would you consider nutritional food distribution projects? I didn't really know how to answer that one. So the, can the person who asked that question come off mute and um, or raise your hand or yeah. uh, put yourself on video so we can find you? Yeah, Evans, could you please raise your hand on Zoom so that we can uh, further expand on your question? Maybe in the meantime, we can answer Paul, Tom. Okay. So Paul, I'm trying to ask you to unmute yourself here. Oh, there you go. Sure, thank you so much. <laughs> so I have maybe a few questions. So sure. uh, one is in terms of uh, the application, that's mm -hmm. the, the entity, that's the organization and the applicant that is the project lead. So now one, one issue here is the project has to be done in the low or middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And then the organization can be in Canada or in those specified countries. Now, the point is, what if the uh, project lead is just temporarily within an institution in Canada, but now has connection with the institution in Canada, and some of the team members will be in the institution of Canada. But this team lead, leader or the project lead is a citizen of that middle income country and will do the project in those income or low income or middle income countries. But now the organization is just Canadian and uh -huh. some of the team members are Canadian. Uh -huh. But, and also this project lead is just the one who is temporarily within that institution. It's only the connection. So how can this one happen? That's maybe one. And the other thing so is- So that's a big question. So let me answer that before we go on to the second question. That's an excellent question. So you're actually in a really fortunate situation because both the Canadian entity and the, the potential project lead are sort of from eligible locations and geographies, right? So I would say if the desire is to apply through the Canadian organization, if the person who has the contacts in the location, the country of implementation, that low middle income country that you're referring to, but is not a formal like permanent employee of the Canadian organization. What I would suggest is to have a permanent formal employee of the Canadian organization apply as the applicant individual and project lead. There is a section in the application that indicates th th where we're asking for details about collaborators and future project co-leads and things like that. I would suggest that the person who is temporarily in Canada but would be expected to really be the lead, especially on the ground, you include the detailed information about that individual in that collaboration section and indicate that they are temporarily with the Canadian organization, but they are from the country of implementation. And so there we're getting the full picture. And then if your project were to move forward and were selected for funding, for instance, then what we do is at that negotiation stage, we would make that person, the, the individual who um, is from the country of implementation, we would make them officially a formal project co-lead. We just can't do that at the application stage for a variety of technical issue reasons. Um, but yeah, so put the information of that individual in the collaboration section, ensure that the application is submitted by an individual who is a formal uh, permanent employee of the Canadian entity. Does that make sense? Clear on that one? Oh, you need to hold on. I'm um, asked to unmute. There we go. We should be good now again. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's very clear. So the point is 
the person uh, has to be like permanent, something with employee in, in Canada. So that one is clear. So maybe the, the last part I was asking is about like, okay, this is an institution and the project lead is the one like doing the application. Uh -huh. And uh, and 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 uh, not the organization because organization is not an individual. It's it's just organization, and then it is the person who is doing the application. So meaning, uh, they are they are up project lead is the one creating the account and then saying which organization that he or she comes from. Oh yeah. So I would suggest that to avoid issues at the eligibility stage the the account should be created in the name of and with the details of the person that would qualify as an eligible project lead and so the person that would qualify as an eligible project lead should be an employee a formal employee of the eligible entity the, yeah does that, does that make sense okay you can work like other people can work like the collaborator, the person that we were that I was saying should be indicated as a collaborator. You can work on the application together. It's just that it needs to be submitted with the details of the eligible project lead. OK. Paul, any other questions that we haven't addressed yet? I think uh, I'm, I'm done with that. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you, thank so you much. Paul. No problem at all. Thank you so much. Okay, I also see we have a hand up from um, Bassi Edith. Edith, um, I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. And please correct me if I've pronounced your name wrong. Well, uh, Edith, you try. Edith, thank you. Well, I have two questions. The first is, um, it's one of the call of action that has to do with an intervention. So if the tension that is related to climate change is in a subset of, of society, so like adolescent children, how now that intervention is looking at, let's say, safety. That's the, you know, the intervention can be put into their mental health or to preparedness for mental health questions. Do I make sense? So for example, if there is a climate change impact of flooding or food insecurity, those yep. are the questions that, so those are the kind of things I'm thinking about, the impact of food insecurity and the impact of climate change and flooding. So I could look at an alarm system, which is a preparedness issue or a response to a climate change impact, which is hunger or displacement. So mm -hmm. those two are two different areas. Can we make the two of them one question, you know, instead of just focusing on this one area? Yeah, and I think this um, kind of ties into a question similar to some, the one that someone else asked earlier about um, multiple addressing multiple areas in, of intervention. Um, mm -hmm. So you're you're flagging flooding and food insecurity, which in some contexts could be overlapping, right? Um, yes. You know, there might be food insecurity as a result of flooding, and so mm -hmm. in that case, that makes total sense. And so, as long as you're making clear why you're doing both at once, essentially, um, and making clear to the reviewers that it is feasible within the timeline and budget of this proposal, then that is not a problem to address these sort of multiple compounding issues um, at once. I would say you mentioned, you know, a sort of alarm system. To me, that would fall into sort of our monitoring, modeling, forecasting uh, bit. Yeah. And so the one, the one just uh, caution that I make is please ensure that um, your uh, your intervention is also proposing not just the alarm, but how are we going to use that alarm to actually ensure improved outcomes for the target population you're working with. That connection piece is essential or else this would be um, filtered out during the, the either eligibility or innovation screen process. Um, so that that connection to the action piece as a result of an alarm or modeling or monitoring solution, um, the connection to action within the community is very important. Yeah, the second question is um, like uh, the previous question somebody asked, um, if the organization implementing partners are straddling two countries, we have mm -hmm. an organization that is embedded in this society that's LMC, and they are working with partners. Let's give an example, partners in the 
the LMC and they are embedded, they are living in Canada. Okay. Um, so you are saying that the person should be the lead person, should be the Canadian registered person so that it's easier. But the third party organization that will be implementing, implementing part would be in the other organization. So we just have a contract between the implement the person that would draw down funds and develop the concept, but implement in LMC countries. Do, do I make sense? Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple cl clarifying questions here. So the is it just the person that lives in Canada, or is the entity also registered in Canada? Yeah, and, the person lives. Uh -huh. The entity is going to work. She's going to work with is in another country, Zambia, for example. Yeah. So so it needs to be the the primary focus needs to be on the entity because the entity is the one GCC is signing a contract with, right? Okay. So yeah. the entity is really what's going to dictate the other uh, components of eligibility. So if the entity is registered, if I heard correctly, in Zambia, yeah, that's fine because that's an eligible country. So mm -hmm. the lead applicant, so the, the initial project lead needs to be someone that is formally employed by that Zambian entity. Okay. So if the if the Canadian if the person who's living in Canada is is actually employed by the Zambian entity, that's fine. She can be the project lead. But if she is not, she's just going to be a collaborator. She should be listed as a collaborator and a employee of the Zambian entity should be the project lead for the application purpose. Okay. So but if she's one um conceptualizing the paper. Yeah. And uh, Doing the um, write up and everything. Yes. So she just has to be employed. She'll be listed as a collaborator. Yeah. So a project lead needs to be a formal employee or uh, in some academic institutions at least have a formal recognized affiliation with okay. um, the eligible entity. It, and again, if she, is, if she is a strong, you know, uh, contributor to the application, to the project, she can be listed as a collaborator and you can emphasize her relevance and role in, in this, but the, the information of the project lead listed in the application must be one formally employed by um, the applicant entity. Okay, and if, if there's any further questions about that, um, Bessie, when you're, when you're applying, you can, if there's like specific details um, that you don't necessarily want to share on the call with 60 people, uh, feel free to follow up with us via email and we'll make sure you get clarity on that so that that's not an issue in your application. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, I see Lori's copying a couple more questions from the chat over to my document here, so I'll read through those. So we have another question from Julie. Um, Indicators related to climate change and health impacts may not be able to be measured until much later than the end of the 18 month project period. How should we deal with these longer term impacts and what do you expect us to be able to show after 18 months? Excellent question, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, monitoring an impact we are very aware um, might be a challenge for some of these projects. Uh, you know, we're, we still don't even, you know, as the sort of ecosystem of folks working in, in climate change and health, still don't have um, sort of gold standard indicators and metrics for these changes either. Uh, so that is um, an entirely different challenge. Um, and so what we expect um, within an 18 month period, if your ultimate impacts are going to be much longer term, are sort of proxy indicators that show progress towards those long-term impacts. Um, and so perhaps uh, like changes in attitudes and behaviors. Um, and uh, also things like process changes. So if your long-term impacts are about um, policy changes, like what progress towards the process of policy change has been achieved by your um, by the end of your project period. Um, I would make very clear in your proposal what will and won't be achievable in terms of evaluation by the end of the 18 month period and what you may hope to continue tracking later on and how you might do that without GCC funds. 
Um, I also want to clarify that um, with all of these proof of concept uh, grants, during the negotiation period, one thing that GCC collaborates on with innovators is the development of the project description, but very importantly, the proof of concept objectives. And so we usually take from what has been presented in the proposal and adapt that to a set of proof of concept objectives. And those are the objectives that GCC holds grantees to achieving by the end of the project period. And so we would work very closely with your team to ensure that these are feasible objectives that demonstrate impact of the intervention, even if it's not the ultimate outcomes that you're seeking to achieve with the intervention, um, but that there is at least progress towards pro positive results. Julie, did you want to come off mute? And is there anything else that we need to, to talk through on this point? Oh, I'm trying to find you, Julie. <laughs> okay, I've just asked you to come off mute. You should be able to now. So sorry, and I don't want to. No. I don't want to monopolize the last end of the call with this question, but certainly um, your answer is um, pretty clear. And I think um, we do have um, a unique situation where we will be monitoring afterwards. So we wanted to be sure that we knew how to reference that in the call, and maybe that's during negotiation. But our our goal is a longer term project anyway, um, but we could see milestones in the middle and, you know, at what point would you like to see that, you know, so I guess you're right, like, as it comes to customizing our call and discussions, we could do it later, but I think that your answer is, you know, definitely is sufficient, like, I get it, Okay, <laughs> makes sense. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. and and I think the the one thing that I always just want um, folks to be really clear about is if you do have these longer term um, ambitions and and uh, metrics that will be measured at a later date, just make that very clear in the proposal so that the um, reviewers are not expecting you to actually be assessing against those metrics at the eighteen month point, for instance. Perfect. Per that makes total sense. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Julie. Uh huh. Um, okay, I see another question here from Paul. Is there a limit to the number of team members in the project? No, there isn't. Um, again, this comes to, you know, if it's a, um, you know, ser heavily service delivery focused intervention, we would generally expect the remuneration category to be higher because you'd need to be paying more salaries for a larger team. Um, it, it all depends on how you're allocating your budget based on the activities that you're going to be um, implementing throughout the project period. But there's no formal um, limit on the number of, of team members. It's, it's, again, one of these things that as long as it's uh, relevant to, to the proposal. Is there any priority for women-headed organizations or women-led persons? Um, so, thinks this is from jobs. So while we will not be uh, actively including or excluding, they'll be reviewed based on the same criteria. We are trying to in actively encourage um, applications from women and non-binary individuals. We always want to ensure that we have as much um, gender diversity in our funding as possible. Um, and so while this is not going to be a component that gives applicants either a leg up or or you know a notch on their on their scoring um because that will not be the case uh we are trying to strongly encourage women and non-binary individuals to apply all right and so i am recognizing that we are now almost 15 minutes over time so we are going to close and i think we've gotten through um the vast majority of the questions here. If you have a um, burning question that was not addressed during our time together today, please feel free to follow up um, via email with the STARS team. I'm gonna copy our email address once more. 
in the chat. I know my colleague has done it a few times already. Oh, she beat me to it. Uh, yeah, so the stars at grandchallenges.ca email address, you'll find our team. We will get back to you within a few days at most. Um, so if you have any specific questions or something that didn't get answered during today's call, please feel free to reach out to us there. Um, once again, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope that um, all of you have either begun or will soon um, prepare your applications. We look forward to reviewing these. Um, so yes, that is where we'll close. Thanks again so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.